Package management and vulnerability scanning is up first. Then we will have a short break in between parts one and two of this workshop. Then we will go into CICD, which gets its own section because it's kind of a big concept and it can get a little bit hairy sometimes. And then we'll wrap up with next steps, thing you, things you may want to look into moving forward. First, a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Kat Cosgrove, and I'm a developer advocate at JFrog. Before that, I was an engineer on the IoT team here, but I didn't get where I am through entirely traditional means. I was a freelance web developer for a few years, but I have also been a bartender and a waiter and a resident horror expert at an independent video rental store. That was uh, probably my favorite non-tech role, actually. And I credit a lot of my success to this kind of windy, non-traditional route to where I am now. It means that I've gotten to see the tech industry from a lot of different angles and have a lot of different kinds of problems. And some of these problems are fairly widespread, like they're not uncommon. And we, for some reason, still are not really addressing them. I would like to put a stop to that so that the next person who comes after me doesn't have to struggle as much as I did with some of this stuff. So if you want to get a hold of me later, that's pretty easy. You can find me on Twitter at Dixie3Flatline. You can also email me at catc at jfrog.com, though I will warn you that I'm not the greatest at responding to my emails quickly, especially now where I get a lot of them. So Twitter is probably faster. I am always, always, always happy to help if it's within my power. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have a question, even if it's about this, like you're going through this yourself again later on and you get stuck, ask me. Housekeeping. First, uh, we need you to fork and clone this repository. The URL is on the slide, but one of the support staff I've brought with me, could you please drop a link in the chat for everybody? Um, I do have support staff and TAs here with me to help you. So if you get stuck or if you have a question, go ahead and ask it in the Q&A box. Uh, that is easier for them to keep track of than the chat. So if you have a question, please try to use the QA box instead. That's, what, that's where they'll be looking first. Uh, do really ask for help. Don't let yourself stay and get stuck. That repository I've asked you to fork and clone contains all of the starter code you need. It also contains all of the documentation. So everything I'm telling you, including commands, are in there. If there is a command that I have listed on a slide and you want to just copy paste it, you will be able to find it in the documentation for the relevant module. The, the readme for the repo has like a, a table of contents in it that you can just click through. So should make it a little bit more accessible. Here we go. First, what is DevOps? DevOps is the term for the union of the development team and the IT operations team through the use of a specific set of practices and tools. Rather than having the development and operations teams handle their own specific responsibilities separately, the two teams should now work together as one super team, essentially. This is both a cultural change and a technology change with the ultimate goal of drastically reducing the amount of time it takes to deliver software. The result is more frequent software deployments, deploying bad updates less frequently, and being able to recover from those bad updates faster because you are always going to push a bad update eventually. Nobody is perfect. Bad updates going to happen. Go ahead and accept it. For developers, DevOps may mean changing the way you write software. I know we don't like change. We will get over it. Uh, your code should be written in a way that is a little bit more modular, so it's easier for other people to maintain. Microservices rather than monoliths is an example of this. 
you need a basic understanding of container technologies, things like Docker and Kubernetes probably, though there are also probably people on your team who specialize in those things. You don't need to be an expert. You should be merging with your source repository and pulling from main often, sometimes multiple times a day and making much, much smaller changes. Build and unit tests need to be run with every single commit. And that process should be automated. Uh, without automation, this becomes a, a bear. Like it is way too much work. But automation makes it fairly easy, once it's set up at least. If the entire team does this, conflicts will happen less often, failures will be discovered much, much earlier, and you can fix them immediately because you know if tests are running with every single commit that something has gone wrong, you can just fix it there. It's great. The cultural shift can take some getting used to. People, you know, don't, they don't like other people putting their nose in their business, but you will be much more efficient and you will be much less stressed out because a lot of the things you were doing manually before are being automated by your tools. But there's a lot of jargon, a lot of it. Uh, we are absolutely swimming in abbreviations and abstractions. And sometimes it's really difficult to define a term satisfactorily without needing to use three more to give it context. It is like running into a brick wall made of words. To make this easier on me and you, I have included a glossary in the docs directory of the repository I asked y'all to fork and clone. Please note that this glossary is a work in progress. Uh, I may have missed something. At first, it's only covering terms that I specifically mention in this workshop. But if you come across a term that's unfamiliar to you in the course of going through this, uh, search the glossary, just command F or control F to find it in the glossary, though it is organized alphabetically. And if it's not there, get in touch with me and I will add it. Uh, you can DM me or you can just open a GitHub issue and I will take care of it for you. Let's go through Artifactory first. We're going to talk about what it is, what it does, and why you should use a binary repository manager. We're going to cover usage for two repository types, uh, Python and then Docker. Uh, Docker, we may go a little bit fast for time, but you will have something functional in your Artifactory repo. So Artifactory is a universal binary repository manager. This means that it can be used to manage your build artifacts, which is compiled binaries, uh, information about your builds, Docker images, Helm charts, whatever, regardless of the technologies you're using. So if you're using Python or JavaScript or C Sharp, Ruby, doesn't matter. It supports 27 different package types explicitly, as well as a generic repository type for everything else. This is not a replacement for source control tools like GitHub or Bitbucket. Think of it as like the place your code goes after it's been written and built or packaged and before it's been deployed. Repositories are broken up into three categories, local, remote, and virtual. Local repositories are what they sound like. They are repositories for your code that exists locally on your machine. Remote repositories are also fairly what it says on the box. They contain remote code, like your project's dependencies. This functions sort of like a cache, so that after the first download, your project pulls its dependencies from the associated remote repo instead of from NPM or PyPy or wherever. Virtual repositories are a little bit weird. They kind of create like an envelope around your uh, local and remote repositories. And this is what you're going to be interacting with most here. A tool like this is used for many different reasons, but the biggest benefits are to companies with a lot of different technologies in their stack and companies that have security concerns requiring them to tightly control both their own code and their dependencies. With the changes to Docker Hub, uh, Artifactory, 
is becoming more important to people who aren't large companies. Let's look at the Python example first. So if y'all get behind, that is okay. Again, uh, all of the instructions are in the repository that y'all have. And if you get stuck, just ask for help. There's also about 15 minutes between sessions where uh, maybe I think we can still help you in the chat. So don't panic. To get started with Python in Artifactory, log into your uh, Artifactory instance that uh, you should have signed up for before. And in the upper right hand corner, click on the drop down that's got your name on it and select Quick Setup. From that screen, select PyPy and click Create. I can show you what that looks like over here. <clears throat> so I'm at catc101.jfrog.io. Click on my name over here, click setup, and select a package type, and then click create. And once you've done that, if you navigate back to Artifactory in the left hand menu and click on Artifacts, you should see your new Python repositories in the file tree. It should be one called PyPy, one called PyPy Local, and one called PyPy Remote. Looks like this. Artifactory can do some of the setup for you. So this uh, is not a huge pain to use as a PyPy replacement. If you click on your PyPy virtual repository in the file tree, that's the one that's just called PyPy. Click set me up in the upper right hand corner, like you see here in this screenshot. And go ahead and enter your platform password in the screen that pops up and it'll automatically populate the various setup commands with your instance information and keys. Then there are a few commands you need, or a few snippets of code you need to put in some places. But the most important one is adding this chunk to your PyPyRC file. Typically, this is found in your home directory and it is a hidden file. So if you aren't familiar with uh, hidden files, they, they all begin with a dot like that. And to see them, you can't just ls. You need to do an lsa. But I will show you what I mean here. PyPy, set me up. And if I were to enter my password here, it would go ahead and populate this section with all of my code. OK. Give you a second to do that. Alrighty. Now let's deploy something. In the terminal, navigate to your forked copy of the repository. And then we need to deploy your Python package as a Python wheel. So you'll run this command, the first one, to deploy it as a wheel, or the second one to deploy it as an egg. Again, if you go to the Artifactory docs in the repository we're all working from, these commands are right there for you to just copy and paste if you like. Note that uh, you may need to either update or install setup tools and wheel for this to work. 
if Python throws an error when you try to deploy the wheel, run this command at the bottom to make sure that setup tools and wheel are installed and updated. They should be. If you have ever worked with Python 3 before, but I prefer not to leave anything to chance. So just in case it throws an angry error about setup tools or wheel, that's the command to make sure that it is installed and set up. And that should help you out some. This is a really small package that I've given you to push. Uh, it's just like a binary tree that does fizzbuzz and a couple of small tests. So it should deploy to Artifactory fairly quickly. If you want to resolve your package from Artifactory, you can do that too. You just need to tell pip where to look. If you're not a Python developer, um, pip is the it's what you use to install Python packages. So you need to tell pip where to look. Also in your home directory, there should be a, a hidden directory called dot pip. And in that directory, there is a pip conf file. You would need to add this chunk of code to your pip conf. Uh, if you go back to the set me up for your PyPy virtual repository, that will include this chunk of code. So you can just copy and paste it from there, pre-populated with your credentials if you just give it your password. And from then on, if you run pip install the package name, it will install from your Artifactory instance rather than from PyPy. So this allows Artifactory to behave kind of as an intermediary between uh, you and your packages and like the wider internet. So you would only have to pull from PyPy once every other time, unless you know something gets updated, you would be pulling from your Artifactory instance. So it's a little bit more tightly controlled. It's easier for you to control quality, control versions, uh, control security by doing it this way. And it's like one extra step at the very beginning, two extra steps at the very beginning, and then it's kind of just there. It's pretty convenient once you get used to it. But let's look at a Docker example real quick. Here, we're going to create a Docker repository type and upload uh, some container images to Artifactory to use it as a Docker registry. Uh, again, this is particularly helpful now with Docker limiting pulls for free accounts from their registry, Docker Hub. So first, again, we set up some repositories. In the upper right hand corner of your platform, click the drop down with your username on it again and select quick setup. From that screen, select Docker, click create, and follow the on screen instructions. There shouldn't be any for Docker, I think. So, again, like this, click on your username in the upper right hand corner, quick setup, and select whatever. I already have Docker repositories, so it's not an option for me here. You can see it's grayed out. Once you've done that, you will see three Docker repositories, Docker, Docker remote, and Docker local. Pause for a second and let people catch up if they need to. Let's get a little container in there. You should already have forked this repository from earlier, but just in case, here it is again. In sample projects slash Docker example, you will find a small Docker file. Open it in your editor of choice, doesn't matter what you use, and update it to reference your server and virtual Docker repository like so. 
it should be templated in the Docker file I'm giving you. So it should say from money server name dot jfrog dot io slash money virtual repo name slash Ubuntu sixteen oh four. For example, if I was going to uh, pull from like my actual artifactory instance, I would change it to from cat c dot jfrog dot io. My virtual Docker repository's name is just Docker. So is yours. So just Docker slash Ubuntu 16.04. And then go ahead and save it. And again, uh, all of this information is in the documentation in the uh, artifactory markdown file in the docs directory. Or you can just click the artifactory heading in the table of contents in the readme. Now open up your terminal again, and we need to build and tag this. In your terminal, log into the Docker client as your JFrog server. So Docker login server name dot JFrog dot IO. In my case, Docker login uh, cat C dot JFrog dot IO. The login information you want to use is the login information for your platform. So your email address and password that you use to sign up. Then still in the terminal from the same directory as your Docker file build and tag your image with this command. I know it looks like it's more than one line on this slide. It's not, it's just a really long command. So you may want to copy and paste this from the documentation, but it's docker build dash dash tag, uh, the address of your virtual repo. So uh, cat c dot jfrog dot io slash docker slash my docker image colon latest space dot. Note the trailing dot that tells it uh, that tells the Docker CLI where to look, and by using a dot, we're saying look in this directory because we are in the same directory as the Docker file we want to build and tag. ought to build pretty quickly. And now we're ready to push it to your repository. Then it's just Docker push and you tell it where. So Docker push, for instance, cat c .io slash Docker slash my Docker image colon latest. Same address you used in the previous command. And then after a few seconds, back in the platform UI in your artifactory repository tree, you should be able to see your Docker image. And instead of pulling from Docker Hub, you can now pull from Artifactory instead. Let's go look. For here is my Docker virtual repository. Here you see my Docker image. Latest is the only version I have. And here it is. All right, let's peel it apart then. Now we're gonna walk through X-Ray. We're gonna cover software vulnerabilities and a little bit of license compliance, go through some setup, manually trigger a scan and learn how to read the results. First, let's talk about what it is. X-Ray is a tool that protects you from security problems in your software. It looks at your dependencies and compares them against known issues in the NVD, the National Vulnerability Database, sorry about more jargon, and optionally against risk-based securities, VulnDB, if you have uh, X-Ray Premium, which is something that like large businesses want to have. Not all vulnerabilities are critical and require immediate attention, though. So. X-Ray presents you with the CVSS score for each vulnerability on a scale from one to 10. 
as well as the severity, low, medium, or high. <clears throat> uh, if a version of that particular dependency exists with a fix for the vulnerability, X-Ray will also tell you that, and it'll tell you what the fix version is so that you can just go ahead and update your dependency immediately. It does take some, it allows you to take some shortcuts. It's pretty neat. Uh, if you have X-Ray Premium and you're working with a lot of open source tools at work, or you're working in a particularly large open source project in your spare time, you probably also need to care about license compliance. X-Ray can keep track of that for you too, so that you don't accidentally add a dependency licensed in a way that conflicts with the rest of your project, thereby avoiding you getting sued. Uh, this is not included in the free tier, but it's worth you know, mentioning. It works on a system of policies and watches. Uh, policies are what allow us to define security and license compliance behaviors. And once they're defined, they are enforced by assigning them to a watch. A watch is kind of the, the scope of where X-Ray is going to go look. It's a collection of repositories, builds, and optionally release bundles that X-Ray should be looking at. Based on the results of the scan, you can go ahead and automate certain actions. It can uh, fail a build if a vulnerability is found that exceeds your comfort level. Uh, it can block downloads, uh, call an external API, or it can just email someone for you. It does a, it does a lot of a lot of hand holding, which I really like personally. This is something that is really, really important for businesses or open source tools that are heavily relied on to have. Uh, it's less important for your personal projects, but still useful. And honestly, it's kind of fun. Um, anyway, it's included in the uh, free tier of the platform. So like you may as well use it, you know, I do. Let's get it working. First, we need to tell it which resources to index in the first place. So navigate to the administration module of the platform by clicking on the little gear icon in the left hand navigation panel. So open a separate menu for you. Then click on the x ray security and compliance menu and indexed resources. We then need to add a repository. So select all of the repositories you want X-Ray to be able to scan. In this case, uh, Docker local and Docker remote, then save. X-Ray only scans what you explicitly tell it to, by the way. So remember that if you add more repositories later, you need to come back here and tell X-Ray to scan them. The scan is somewhat labor intensive so it's best to index only the repositories you actually need to watch rather than indexing absolutely everything. Give you a second in case anyone is behind. Let's define a security policy to start. So go back to the application module in the left-hand menu, expand the security and compliance menu, and click the policies menu item. Then we're going to create a new policy, call it uh, docker-security, of the type security. The type should be selected by default for you. Then go ahead and add a rule. Name it medium security and select medium from the minimal severity dropdown. From here, you can also make some other things happen. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, failing builds, blocking downloads, calling a third party API, et cetera. Then go ahead and save it. And we need to define a watch to tell it what to look at. Back in the application module in the left-hand menu, expand security and compliance again and click watches. Then go ahead and create a new watch. 
call it sample watch with your two repositories, docker-local and docker-remote. And assign your Docker security policy to it by clicking manage policies. Uh, again, if you have gotten behind and you feel like you are stuck and you're never, ever, ever going to catch up, uh, I am happy to like personally help you with this later. If it's, if you think it would be better to just sit and watch and absorb, that's okay too. Cause all of these instructions are in the repo as well. Uh, it is theoretically possible to do this self-guided, but, and if you, if you try to do that, happy to help you personally if you get a hold of me online later. Okay. Next. Now we need to manually trigger the scan. Hover over your watch and click apply on existing content to manually trigger it. This scan may take some time to complete. It's not immediate uh, and it depends on a few variables, but the size of the repository matters. We are pulling Ubuntu, so it's not huge, but it's, you know, it's beefy. Uh, you can return here later and view your results by clicking on the watch, but x-ray data will also start to show up in a few other places within the platform. And I'm going to switch over to my platform and show you now for anyone whose scan is taking time to run. So over here in Artifactory, in Artifacts, my Docker virtual repository, remember we told it to scan Docker. We're gonna look at my Docker image, the latest version and the manifest JSON. So it's just the manifest in my Docker file should see, where did it go? Oh, it didn't scan on mine either. Let's look here. There we go. In my local repo, click on, you'll see an x-ray tab here. And these are all of the violations that came up. There are 48 security issues in general, but four of them violated the policy I defined that said, hey, let me know if there's something medium problematic or above. And we came up with these four issues. We can get a little bit more information either by looking at all of the issues, most of which are like, you know, low impact, things that are probably never gonna be fixed but if we click on one of these, we get a little bit more detailed with it. We know what type of package this vulnerability exists in. We get a short summary of the actual issue, the severity, when this was created, the relevant CVE, if you wanna look up more and links out to a few references to tell you like, in detail what's going on. You also get this pretty snazzy looking impact analysis graph. I really like these because I'm a very visual learner and it's uh, it's easier for me to understand like what's, what's going on if I have an illustration. Maybe I'm just like an overgrown child, I don't know. Doesn't matter. This is way more impressive looking if you have like a huge container with a lot of layers. This one is very small for uh, speed and ease of sharing it with y'all, but you get the picture. We see that the issue is in uh, my Docker image in latest here and all the way down here. It's very specific, makes it uh, much faster to find out where the exact problem is. There are also reports you can run manually at any time. I've run a couple before, so I'll just show you what they look like. This one is pretty large, 268 rows of results, because I told it to just give me like every single security problem that exists 
for this particular Docker container, every single one. And that was like 260. But the, the reports run very, very, very quickly. It's the initial scan that can be time consuming, again, depending on the size of what you're scanning. But once the scan is done, reports can be run almost immediately. If we click new report, say handed a scope, I want it to look at repositories select repositories, we'll give it Docker local, PyPy local, Docker remote, PyPy remote, move those all over and save. And here you can specify like a particularly vulnerable component, uh, a specific artifact. You can search by CVE, uh, severity or CVSS2 score, and also some publish and scan date specification. So here you can really like narrow down a report, even if you're trying to look at like the totality of what you have x-ray scanning to see like big picture, what do your vulnerabilities look like uh, across multiple repos, across multiple projects. Okay. Uh, so these are screenshots from the quick tour, just in case you missed any of my actual tour. Uh, this is what the x-ray data results look like in the Docker manifest for the Docker container we pushed and the four vulnerabilities that violated the policy we defined. That's also a screenshot of the impact analysis graph. So uh, I will hand out this slide deck as well, by the way, after this workshop is done. So you'll have access to all of these resources too. And now we are going to, got about five minutes until the end of part one for us to handle any additional questions and help people out if they are stuck. And then we've got about a 15 minute break, go get more coffee, have a snack, get a new glass of water, whatever. And then we will move on to part two, where we will go over CICD in detail, including what is CICD? Because it is, uh, it's older than we think. So folks are <clears throat> If you have questions, go ahead and drop it in the QA box. I'm also happy to answer questions in the chat if you like, but our support team very much prefers the QA, but I don't mind. So you can ask me questions in the chat, but they will only answer you in the QA. Uh, yes, hydration check. It's important to stay hydrated, especially me because I'm up here like talking constantly. Oh, was my cat wandering around in the background? Once again, for all of the listeners, if you feel like you are behind, that is totally okay. It's, it's fine, I promise. We are here to help you if you get stuck. And the documentation in the repository I have handed out is written so that in theory, it should be possible to do this in a self-directed manner. Aside from some of the setup for prerequisites, if you're completely unfamiliar with Docker, uh, you've never used Git or GitHub, that may require some additional um, documentation. But if you are stuck there, just reach out to me. Like really, it is my job. It is actually my job. So please just reach out and I will help you happily. Uh, 
a question from the chat from Matthew Glassman, missed the beginning. How did you wind up in DevOps and what attributes does one need? Are you a developer or infrastructure and additional resources? Uh, so I was a software engineer before I was working in IoT at JFrog. Um, honestly, I fell into DevOps because I was working as an engineer in IoT for a DevOps company. And before that, I didn't really know much about DevOps in general. I was a freelance web developer before that. And I, uh, I automated a lot of stuff in my like personal life using Python, but being exposed to be able to being able to automate um, like more of my actual work was pretty rad. <laughs> uh, I'm like I'm the the type of lazy developer who's willing to do like a ton of extra work at the very beginning to make sure that I do not have to repeat myself again ever. Like I don't like having to deal with things like deployment or infrastructure manually. I, I hate it. I hate it. It's so boring for me. Lots of people love it. I can't stand it. So DevOps is, is great because I don't have to deal with it much. You know, um, I do some of the setup once with the assistance of people who are much better with ops and infra than I am. And then if we have both done our jobs right, we don't really have to babysit it anymore. It's pretty, it's pretty great. So I'm a developer but I have mad respect for people who specialize in infra. Uh, it's like, they're, they're different skill sets uh, that doesn't, infra doesn't call out to me as much. So you're coming from a support background, but looking at DevOps as a change, great. That sounds like a good fit. Uh, I worked in early in my tech career. I worked in technical support for a um, data backup company. So there is definitely a path there. Uh, not sure where to get started. Uh, Emily Freeman wrote an excellent book called DevOps for Dummies. Uh, I would read that. Um, a couple of our co-founders and my manager also wrote a book about DevOps called Liquid Software. Also a great read. Both of those should be available pretty readily online. Uh, both of them are definitely available uh, from like online book retailers. You know which one I'm talking about. Uh, Camille, you don't necessarily need to install Linux on your Windows 10 machine. Um, you, there's a Windows subsystem a Windows a Linux subsystem for Windows you can install on Windows 10. Uh, I think we got your email address. I have some like very specific instructions I can send you that might help you with that from when I used to teach at a boot camp because we also had them do that. So that, uh, that is something I can send you additional information on and we should be able to get you going. Uh, did you have any particular resources to get you started in Python automation? Yeah, I just learned Python uh, through um, learn Python the hard way and uh, automate the simple stuff. I like both of those books quite a lot. Yes, I love learn Python the hard way so much. Okay, once again, thank you, Miss Cosgrove. Okay, guys, we'll be breaking for the next 15 minutes. I hope everybody okay. got some water or uh, coffee or whatever. And I'm ready to jump back in if y'all are. Go ahead and unshare your screen so I can bounce in. <laughs> there you go, take it away. Alrighty. Here we go again. So uh, if you are just now joining us, uh, part one is a prerequisite for like really being able to complete this, but there's still information you can uh, learn from just by listening to this, even if you can't participate. 
Uh, again, my name is Kat Cosgrove. I'm a developer advocate at JFrog. And if you need to get a hold of me after this, uh, that's how on Twitter at Dixie3Flatline, or you can email me at catc at jfrog.com. Uh, earlier, I saw some questions about the cat. Her name is Espresso. She's very glamorous and she likes attention. And she gets, uh, she gets jealous that uh, I get more attention than she does. So this is, this is her moment in the spotlight. Let's go. In this module, we're going to teach you about CICD as a concept. You'll also learn how to use JFrog pipelines to automate a few things that you are probably doing manually right now. First, let's talk about what CICD stands for. The CI stands for continuous integration, and the CD can stand for either continuous delivery or continuous deployment. Practicing continuous integration means merging all developers working code base with the source multiple times a day. Doing this requires a series of automated build and unit tests to ensure that none of the proposed changes are going to cause any problems. But the result is that bugs and integration issues are discovered way earlier in the development process. Um, ideally, a build is triggered with every single commit. That way, failures are caught immediately and corrected immediately by the developer. Doesn't have to go all the way through three teams to find out that something is wrong. This also forces engineers to write code that is more modular, which makes it easier to support later on. The interpreter or the compiler or whatever uh, might actually be dealing with your code, but other humans have to maintain and extend it. So readability is important. This is more relevant to some to, to students, at least in my experience, um, having <laughs> taught more than my fair share of them. Um, it might be cute and impressive to like cram a solution into one line by involving like three ternaries uh like map and reduce nested and some regex just for just for fun but um it's really hard to read and really hard to maintain so save that for like code golf competitions and those are really 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 fun but it, uh, it doesn't belong in anything that other people are gonna have to look at. Cause frankly, six months from now, when you go back and look at that line of code, you're not gonna know what it means either. The difference between the two CDs, uh, continuous delivery means what it says on the box. So your software updates are continuously delivered. In concert with continuous integration, this means that you should have the ability to deploy a new build very, very rapidly because you've already automated some of the quality gates that would otherwise need to be performed manually, like building and testing. That reduction in manual labor means you get to release a bunch of small changes rather than one huge update every couple of months. Since you are now making smaller, more incremental changes, you can also be more confident that your release is not going to break when you deploy to your users. Continuous deployment is similar, but it goes one step further. The deployment is automated too. In continuous delivery, there is still a manual quality gate involved before an update is out in the wild. And this is kind of a controversial step for some. It does require a lot of trust in your system, but personally, I am a huge fan of automating that away. Uh, for a modern DevOps pipeline and thus you to be as efficient as possible, human involvement has to be removed wherever possible. I say this a lot, um, probably in like, I don't know, 40% of the talks I give, but humans are really, really bad at repetitive tasks. We are just not good at it. And that's not our fault. It's not something we can control. It's not something we can practice away. We get bored, we get distracted, and we are really, really slow. But if you write good comprehensive tests and then accept that you're absolutely going to deploy a bad update eventually, whether a human is involved in pushing the big red deploy button 
or not, then you'll you'll do better. Like the, the bad update is gonna happen. Human involvement in pressing deploy does not reduce your chances of pushing a bad update. What matters is how quickly you can respond to and correct a bad update. Both continuous delivery and continuous deployment help get you there. Um, continuous deployment, the big green button for me is a safety blanket. Um, it does take some getting used to. You do have to really, really trust your pipeline and truly really trust the person writing your tests, but you're still gonna deploy something that crashes eventually. To get started, you need a CI CD tool. Uh, we are going to be using JFrog pipelines because it's built into the platform you're all using. This is what's gonna automate a bunch of manual processes for you. You set something as a trigger like telling it to watch your source repository for a commit or a merge. You then get to configure a series of steps, each with pass fail conditions, like telling it how to run your unit tests, uh, build the code, scan for vulnerabilities, or deploy your application to wherever. If you have a sufficiently detailed CI CD pipeline, then you don't really have to do anything but write code and push it. The system can handle everything else for you. You just have to tell it what to do. Using JFrog pipelines, these steps are defined with a format called YAML in a file that lives in your code repository. At least in this case, it lives in your code repository. There's also a web interface that gives you a graphical overview of what your steps look like with logging output so you know exactly what's going on in each steps. Uh, a lot of other CI CD tools you might have heard of will behave in a fairly similar way. There's an ongoing joke that uh, everything in DevOps is YAML. Uh, it's kind of true. It's not even really, <laughs> really a joke. Like you see, people who work in DevOps cracking jokes about it on Twitter or whatever, but uh, it's only funny because it's true. <laughs> it is like heavily YAML. So this section is a little bit more involved than the other ones. We need to start by adding an artifactory integration. So go back to your JFrog platform and Hop on over to the pipelines menu on the left and click on integrations. Your pipeline is going to be consuming and producing artifacts and builds, so we need to connect it to Artifactory for that to work. We need to generate and copy an API key from your user profile. So click on the admin username on the top right of the JFrog platform and select edit profile. Enter your password and then click the gear icon to generate an API key and copy it. I will show you what that looks like. Hop over here, edit profile. I'm not going to actually enter my password because y'all don't need to see my API keys and everything, but Enter your password here, click unlock, and then there'll be a gear icon right here. Just click that and that will uh, generate your API key for you. Okay, then back to the application module, expand the pipelines menu on the left and click integrations. Then create a new integration of the type Artifactory, call it ART, A-R-T. Since I went ahead and wrote this uh, pipeline for you, some of these names in here are very specific and case sensitive. So ART, A-R-T of the type Artifactory and the URL should be your server name slash Artifactory. So in my case, catc.jfrog.io slash artifactory, then add your username and the API key you just copied. I will show you mine. So an integration name of art, A-R-T is here. Let's look at it. You can see that my URL 
zoom in on that for you. The URL is catc101.jfrog.io slash artifactory. User is catc101 at jfrog.com because that's the email address for this. And then my API key. I'll pause a second to make sure everybody has got that set up. see lots of people making uh, YAML engineer jokes. Yep, that too, also very common uh, DevOps joke. I think eventually somebody will have an actual job title of YAML engineer. If that doesn't exist already, uh, I think that will definitely be a thing, master of time and white space. That's good too. I haven't heard that one. All right, up next we need to add a second integration, a GitHub integration. This is where you will need to also log into your GitHub account. First, log into your GitHub account in a new tab and generate a personal access token called pipelines-token that has all permissions for repo and admin repo hook. To do that, uh, in GitHub, click your profile picture in the upper right hand corner, go to settings, and then developer settings and personal access tokens. So we'll go over here, settings, developer settings, personal access tokens, and then generate new token. Do Note that uh, you have to copy this immediately when you get it because it won't display it to you again. Uh, also, don't let anybody see that token unless you like want them to have access to your entire GitHub repo. Uh, that's this is why like I'm not doing um, these parts of the setup live. There's not really a way for me to do this without like flashing API keys all over the place for the uh, 88 people watching me. And uh, I'm sure you're all like very trustworthy, but you don't need access to my GitHub account. Anyway, once you have that personal access token back in the JFrog platform, you need to uh, navigate back to the application module and create a new integration of the type GitHub going to name that one my github and use the token you just created in your github account. So I will zoom back in so you can see what this looks like. The name is my underscore underscore github. Again, these are these names do need to be exact. So if your pipeline barfs later on, the first thing you're going to want to look at is to make sure that your integrations are named the right things. Um, and once again, for anybody who may be new, the repository we're all working from, uh, Cat Cosgrove slash DevOps 101 ATO, that includes all of the documentation that we need. So we're here in the pipelines module right now. It's got written instructions for just about everything for you. Pause a sec, make sure everybody's got that integration set up. Check the Q&A. Uh, what scope did the D GitHub token need? It needs a repo and admin repo hook. Ooh, I love flavored soda water.
if you are stuck, if you need help, I do have support engineers from JFrog with me acting as my uh, trusty TAs and they are available in the QA box. They might miss you if you put your message in the chat instead of the QA box. Uh, I am watching the chat and responding when I can, but if you have questions for support, if you're stuck, if you get behind, you need clarification, I didn't do my job well enough um, and explain something, then go ahead and throw it in QA and one of us will help you. Okay. So in the fork of this repository that I had y'all fork and clone, there is a Python example repository, the one we pushed to Artifactory earlier. We need to make some changes to some stuff in there. I've given you a predefined sample pipeline YAML file. So open that up in your editor of choice. Don't really care. I'm a big fan of Sublime Text, but if you want to use JetBrains or Visual Studio or Atom, it's up to you. Real chaotic with it, Notepad, up to you. Go ahead and update the pipeline definition by editing the pipelines.yml file and changing the path from my repository to your fork. For example, uh, the like original copy of this repo is at catcosgrove slash devops 101 dash workshop. You'll see it in the uh, path line of the YAML. So if you were my community manager, uh, Lori, her GitHub is Lori LaRusso. So if she was doing this, she would change path to Lori LaRusso slash DevOps 101 workshop. That is in the YAML file. Yes, Lori, you're famous. You're going to be in every one of these workshops, whether you're here or not, whether you like it or not. All right. Go ahead and save it. Okay. There we go. Now we add a pipeline source. So you do need to like commit and push that as well. Add a pipeline source. So navigate back to the application module expand the pipelines menu again, and then the pipeline sources menu. Add your forked GitHub repository as a single branch pipeline source. It should be set single branch by default. So just leave it as single branch. The integration should be named my underscore GitHub, just like we set up earlier, it should be available from a dropdown. And the repository full name should be the path to your forked repo. For example, cat Cosgrove slash DevOps dash 101 dash workshop. You can leave the branch set to main or master, whatever you have it set as a default to. I think GitHub defaults to main now. Mine here is set to dev because that's where I was setting up this demo. And uh, the pipeline config filter should be set to pipelines.yml, which again should be the default hop over here and I will show you. So we're gonna look at this in just a second. Okay. Wait a sec to make sure everybody is good. Okay. And next we're gonna manually trigger the pipeline, but first I wanna talk about this pipeline source because it does give you a little bit of extra information and it's kind of hard to cram into a slide. Uh, this is all very condensed because I have my screen zoomed in so that it's easier for uh, people to see it on the Zoom. But these are my pipeline sources. This is the only one I have set up just for this workshop. This is it tells you right off the bat which repository it's associated with, which branch it's looking at, 
its latest status. So like the last time it ran, did it succeed or did it fail? Uh, what the pipelines config is named. In my case, it's still pipelines.yaml. It's last sync with uh, GitHub. I haven't uh, pushed to this repo since I set this up last month. So it's last sync is correct, but the last run is more recent. Uh, who last made changes to it? That's me. And a little bit of context, it gives you the first bit of the commit hash and the um, commit message. There are also logs here. Uh, the logs here are really, really boring right now because everything worked. <laughs> so there's not really anything exciting to look at, unfortunately. Uh, I guess I could have intentionally um, left a typo or something and then fixed it, but here we are. If there was an actual problem, like a syntax error with your YAML, which is a fairly common uh, mistake to make with YAML, like, uh, something gets indented too far or not enough and the whole thing just blows up, it would tell you that right here. So it's uh, gives you a clearer path to chasing down what the, what the problem is. All right, now we're gonna manually trigger the pipeline. Uh, once it's synced, uh, if you've pushed the change to GitHub and set up the GitHub integration, it should sync and you'll see it here. Uh, but if you need to sync it manually, you can press this button and it'll sync manually. You can also edit it from here, but yeah, you'll sync. So yeah, I corrected a typo, I guess, uh, this morning. Good to know. Anyway, once it's synced, we're going to manually trigger the pipeline. To do that, go back to the application module, expand the pipelines menu again, and click the My Pipelines menu item. Your pipeline should be called basic underscore pipeline because that's what I called it, and you probably haven't changed it. Then you'll get this big, pretty graphical overview of all the steps involved in your pipeline. If you click on step one, like in the step one box in the graphical overview, it'll give you a menu then click play to trigger this step. This can take a couple of minutes to run the first step because uh, it's got a bunch of stuff going on, but I'm going to walk you through mine just in case yours runs a little bit slowly. It just depends on how much is in the queue and node pools and whatnot. So let's look at my pipelines. Right here, because mine's run before, you already get a little bit more info. You can see that it was last triggered by catc101 at jfrog.com. That means it was triggered by me manually and not triggered by something being pushed to my GitHub account. But we will see in here what it looks like when something is triggered automatically. This is how long it took to run, just three minutes. It's last success. It was, it was successful last time. I can show you a barfed one as well though. And it was connected to branch dev. So let's look at the pipeline. This is what the whole overview looks like. Again, we get more context up here. Step one, if I wanted to run it, I would click here. There is some stuff going on inside this pipeline. Each of these steps has a little bit of something, but only one of them is really doing something complicated. Uh, here you'll see, this is what it looks like when it gets triggered um, by GitHub. So this is me like pushing code to the workshop and the pipeline triggering as a result. Uh, when something bad happens, it uh, very loudly tells you that something bad has happened. But let's look at this last successful run and see what's going on in here. We can look at each of these steps individually to get a little bit more context, find out what's happening. Each one of them is gonna have a queuing step, some setup, booting the container, it's running in, uh, required resources, in this case, it's the git sync to get access to my repo and actually executing the step. In this case, we're adding some run variables, uh, writing some build info, just context, metadata, that kind of thing. 
and creating uh, environment variables. You can create environment variables with different scopes inside of a pipeline. It makes it pretty, pretty fun, pretty powerful for automating like a, a wide variety of stuff. It's not just like the digital version of Tinker Toys. You don't just like plug stuff together and pray <laughs> pretty much. You can just straight up bash script in here if you want to. There are native integrations plugins for all kinds of things. I'll show you some of those in a second. But if you need to, you can just bash, which I will do here. Here I am going to CD into my Git repos resource path, um, printing the present working directory just to show what's going on, CDing in and running PyTest. Because remember those Python, that Python package I had y'all push, it's got a very, very, very small little baby test suite, a uh, little tiny one. So I did this with bash pretty clean, just update and install Python 3 pip, install PyTest, and then run PyTest on my tiny little baby package to make sure all of its tests are passing, and they are. And then we clean up and move on. Here we've got two steps running side by side. So they don't really rely on each other, and they both feed into step five. This one has an environment variable that was declared inside of a step rather than globally. And this one is just echoing the app version. There are a ton of environment variables that are just available to you by default if you want to do some manipulation of what's going on. And step five is just going to print my GitHub token and my rate limit. If you want to see what this actually looks like, you can view the YAML for your pipeline in here as well. If you forget what's going on and you don't want to go digging through a GitHub repo, you can just view it right here and it'll show you everything broken up into your steps and your resources. So all of my steps are defined here and all of my resources, build info and my Git repo are over here. As far as integrations that come with it out of the box, it's it's a lot. Uh, Airbrake, AWS, Artifactory, which we're already using, Azure Keys, Bitbucket, Bitbucket Server, Distribution is another JFrog product, DigitalOcean, Docker Registry, Google Cloud, like Jenkins, Jira, Kubernetes, Slack, SSH, just a webhook. Uh, the outgoing webhook one is particularly useful. I really like that one. But anything that you can't integrate with directly through one of these like little plugins, you can just script it inside of the pipeline. Uh, that's actually a very small pipeline. If you've never seen one before, it's small. It's not doing a lot. It's there just to show you what it looks like. But a really, really large involved pipeline can start to look kind of messy uh, from the YAML itself, which is why these kinds of graphical overviews are very, very useful. They make it much more uh, palatable, much, much easier to deal with when you can just get a graphical overview. But again, if you're the type that has an easier time with the YAML itself, I'm not the type, then Everything is also right here for you to just take a look at and get a little bit more context, a little bit better feeling for what is going on. Pop back over here. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the actual workshop. Uh, I am here for another 15 minutes to answer your questions and work with the support staff to help you. If you are behind, if you're still stuck, if you have additional questions, you want more context, you have questions about stuff that I didn't mention in this workshop, because it is a very intro level workshop. 
uh, happy to take those. Support staff will take questions in the Q&A box, and I will also be looking at the chat if you have questions for me. I'll have both of them open, so wherever works for you, but support finds it easier to handle it in the QA box. Uh, I will drop the link to this repository in the chat again, so that anybody who came in late can go do this as well. Open for me, chat. There we go. Repo. So, oops. All panelists and attendees. There we go. So the repo that I was working from is right there in the chat. Uh, after this is over, um, I will also link my, I'll update that repository's readme to include a link to these slides so you have all of the screenshots and my speaker notes as well, if that makes it easier for y'all to go through it without me if you want to. Very, but if you try to go through it without me, uh, once again, and you get stuck, please, please do just reach out to me because I'm, I'm happy to help you if I have the time. Uh, I might be a little bit slow if I get a ton of requests for help, but uh, I'm definitely happy to try if it's within my power, because again, it's my job. But also, I remember having to learn all of this myself at the beginning, and it wasn't easy. Um, I, I didn't find it easy, at least, to learn at first. So if you're struggling with this, if you're finding it difficult, that's that's okay. It's it's normal. It's not you. It's just it's hard. This this many layers of abstraction can be kind of difficult to deal with. Uh, if you don't have the additional context, if you're like totally new to the industry, it can be really really hard. Uh, which again is why I included this glossary. This glossary should make it a little bit less painful because uh, there's a lot of jargon in DevOps, like I said earlier in the presentation. And I hope this eases some of the pain for you. A lot of these words might seem very, very basic, um, but I promise you that to some people they aren't. They aren't very, they aren't very basic. They are very domain specific. And I found content like this helpful when I was learning. So I'm just trying to give back to the, with some of the things that helped me. Do you have any resources for us that you could shout out right now? Um, yes. Liquid Software is uh, a book about DevOps, very uh, broadly about DevOps, written by uh, two of JFrog's co-founders and my manager, Baruch Sadagursky, who is also speaking at All Things Open, though he is speaking right now, actually. <laughs> uh, I would also re recommend uh, DevOps for Dummies, which is by Emily Freeman. It's also a, a really, really, really good intro book. Both of them are available on your favorite uh, extremely large uh, online book retailer. I'm sure you all know which one I'm talking about. Uh, yes, also our documentation is also is pretty robust. It's, it's big. The get started guide is really helpful for, for just like hands on getting your getting in there, getting a little bit dirty uh, in the weeds with DevOps. A lot of the stuff in the getting started guide has already been covered in the course of this workshop, but it's still helpful to have another perspective. It's helpful to do this more than once. It's helpful to do this again with, uh, with different repository types. Um, like I said, there are 27 repository types supported by uh, Artifactory. So here's, here's Conan, which is the, the package manager for C and C++ that I've got repos for. Um, let's see. Conda, RubyGems, Go, uh, Gradle, Maven can act as a Helm registry as well, not just uh, Docker, Chef, uh, Vagrant, NPM, 
all kinds of stuff. And all of them have the same uh, fairly streamlined setup for your repositories. So there's no reason why you couldn't just go through this again, substituting your preferred language for whatever I'm mentioning in the workshop instructions, though, of course, you'll have to provide your own sample code. Uh, for now, I will eventually be adding um, sample code for more languages, probably JavaScript and um, Go will be next, but they're all fairly similar. So if you have a preferred language, if you don't know Python and you don't care about Docker, or you just don't want to install Docker, that's fair. There are 27 different package types here you can you can play with. Like for, for NPM, it's fairly clear cut as well. You just set the registry to your artifactory NPM uh, virtual repo. It's a little bit different if it's scoped packages, but the command is still there for you. So if you go through our documentation, there's a, a fair there's a fair amount of content there to help you go even further. Any more questions from anyone? Questions about the platform, questions about DevOps. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, John. Thank you, William. Questions about my cat. Questions about my favorite flavors of soda water. I do appreciate you all taking the time to attend and uh, work through all this with me. I really, I really hope it was helpful. Uh, I wish this kind of content existed when uh, when I was a newbie, or at least was readily available when I was a newbie. If it existed, I couldn't find it. Uh, are there any books specific for pipeline design? Uh, so those are, I would think that would be pretty specific to the tool you're using. Like certainly there are, there's gotta be a, like a wealth of written content out there for like Jenkins because it's been around for so long. But uh, specific guides for pipeline design, uh, probably, probably difficult to specify without knowing which tool you're using and like what the situation is. Certainly there are best practices uh, for different situations. Like uh, my coworker Baruch is speaking about uh, best practices in container promotion in a pipeline uh, right now. So if they post recordings online, definitely watch that talk later on. Uh, his name is Baruch Sadagursky. So yeah, that one's kind of situational, but if you want to um, shoot me an email at catc at jfrog.com with a little bit more uh, context, a little bit more detail on what you're looking for and what your particular situation is, I'll be happy to see if I can find any resources that are relevant and um, actually helpful and shoot them along to you. Uh, send in my resume to JFrog JK. But what if actually though, email me. Email me your resume. Actually, we're hiring. So go ahead, email me your resume. CatC at JFrog.com. Yes, I will put it in the chat real quick. That's how you get a hold of me via email. Uh, can't make any promises on uh, on that, but I am I'm happy to take a look at it, and I'm happy to also forward it along to our HR department if uh, we've got something that seems like a good fit for you. Uh, more of the 101 kind of courses help a lot since I'm not totally in DevOps yet, but am wanting to migrate there. Thank you. Uh, this, this content is a lot more time consuming to write than a technical deep dive. And, uh, like, like genuinely, I really truly do appreciate compliments like that because it, it justifies the extra time I spend building stuff like this, um, for a 101 audience. It's, uh, I like writing this content more than I like writing a technical deep dive. I, it's more, 
satisfying and helpful. Uh, for people saying, I would love to connect on LinkedIn, I will go back to my slide there so that you can see my, uh, my LinkedIn URL. And yes, please do fill out the feedback form. And uh, in the last question, there is a request for more content. There's a, there's a very limited amount of content I can fit into a two hour long workshop or in this case, hour 45. So, um, or hour and a half. So in the future, there will be different versions of this workshop that maybe go like more in depth on one thing and less in depth on another or swap one section out entirely for something else or hard focuses on a specific language instead of going broad. So if, if there are things that you would like to learn about on a, on a one-on-one basis, please let me know in the survey or email me or DM me on Twitter and I will be more than happy to write that content because I love doing it. And I just need to know what y'all want. I need to know what you wanna, what you wanna learn about. Okay, Kat, like just, excuse me, this session you have five minutes remaining or yeah. what the session ends, okay. Sure, um, if anybody has any more questions, there's only about four minutes left before we wrap up um, or you can, again, email me, DM me on Twitter. My contact info is in the slides on the screen. Thank you for all the compliments, everyone. It's very sweet. I do appreciate it. stuff in the QA box. Uh, what's an educational license look like for JFrog? I actually do not know the, know the question for that or the answer to that. That is a question for um, our sales team probably, but uh, please email me about that and I will make sure that that gets forwarded to the right person in sales to address. Uh, quick question from a previous session. Python 3 setup.py is just uploaded. It throws local SSR certificate verify failed error. Do I need to import the cert to get this to work? Oh, no, that is a weird Python problem that I forget the solution to. Oh, God, what did I do to fix that? I had that problem a couple months ago and I don't remember what it was. It's an issue with pip, I think. Um, I think you need to uninstall and reinstall pip, honestly. But it, I, I think that is a that is an issue with um, with pip or pip three. Yes, it is a knowledge marathon, but that's okay. That's good. I'm glad there's a break in the middle so people have uh, time to get their heads screwed on straight. I have a chance to drink some water because your mouth gets pretty dry after like an hour straight of talking, but I am glad it's been helpful. Uh, it's my favorite type of presentation to give. If anybody else has anything, um, get a hold of me online, email or Twitter. And uh, we're out of time. So I will go ahead and hand it back.